How does a registered sex offender hide an 11 year old girl for 18 years? So today we're going to talk about Philip Garrado. And I've got to warn you, this is a pretty dark case. Born in Pittsburgh in 1951, after high school, Garrado would spend many years struggling with drugs. Three years after his graduation in 1972, he was arrested for drugging and the rape of a 14-year-old girl. Garrado wouldn't see any prison time as the 14-year-old refused to testify. Four years after that, Garrado was sentenced to 50 years in prison for the abduction rape of 25-year-old Catherine Calloway. He head into the steering wheel. Uh, he pulled my keys out of the ignition. He had grabbed handcuffs out of his pocket, grabbed both my hands. He overpowered me. He was much larger than me. Um, then he maneuvered me over into the passenger seat, made me put my head in my lap, and he tied my... In Lensworth Penitentiary, Garrado would meet his wife, Nancy. Eleven years after his sentence, he was paroled. After prison, Nancy and Garrado would move in with Philip's mother. They would often find themselves in local parks doing musical performances that Nancy would tape. sit down next to them, play nice, mm -hmm. sound interested, and somehow coax them into move, moving around and right. so they could be videotaped. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we talking less than 20? More than 20? Somewhere between 10 and 20? Maybe. Somewhere, maybe, maybe. somewhere in that? Maybe. In 1991 in Mayes, California, an 11-year-old girl named J.C. Dunard was abducted on her way to school. She was driven three hours away from her home by Philip and Nancy, where she would spend the next 18 years a prisoner. Over those 18 years, she would give birth to two of Philip's children. The main garden was a secret compound filled with sheds and tents. Investigators is Garrido's complex backyard and multiple clues and layers as we can now take a visual tour from above to the smallest details inside his secret room. A series of ramshackle tents and sheds, one soundproof, all of them able to lock from the outside where JC and her children, Angel and Starlet, were forced to live. And as if to mask the disgusting conditions, amid the filth was this welcome sign. Little did his parole officers know what was lurking behind Philip's fence. Sometime in 2018, Philip came to the conclusion that he was sent to the earth to convey a message from the creators and believed he could control sound with his mind, just as any rational person would. He founded a church and would need to go on to spread the message of his religion. Parole officers would come and go, but never find JC and the two kids. On the 24th of August, Corrado would drop off a four-page essay to the San Francisco FBI headquarters. Philip Garrido's manifesto claims he's figured out how to cure his, quote, fantasies about sex and violence, saying, This is the process God and his son provided me with as I clean the inside of the mind, not just to make it look that way on the outside. And how now, when he was with a woman, he felt the kind of excitement we all find when we first meet someone. The oh, same day, Garrado walked into the University of California Berkeley police officer with his two daughters. He started talking about, um, he started talking about his organization and my immediate question to him was, what is it we could do for you? How does this relate to the University of California campus? And he began to go on and on, and, and his thoughts were all over the place, so he wasn't consistent. And he says, well, this is going to be really big. It has something to do with the government and the FBI, and you see Berkeley is involved because we're going to have it here. So I asked him if it was okay to schedule him at 2 o'clock, which would have been for Tuesday the 25th, and he said, yeah, great, that's excellent. I'm, I look forward to sitting down. You're going to really love this. When I tell you about it, it's going to change the world. And My initial impression of him that he was clearly unstable um, the girls appeared to be extremely, um, they were very quiet, they were very subdued. Uh, they were not The older girl typically stared straight up at the sky, didn't make eye contact. Um, so I said, well, let's, let's, let's do a records check on his name and see what kind of person we're dealing with. If it was enough that hinked her up, it was worth, you know, seeing 
you know, what his history was. So I went to dispatch and I ran a, you know, just a routine records check on his name and they informed me that he was on parole, uh, federal parole for kidnapping and rape and he was also a sex registrant. And once they told me that, my kind of red flags went up because she had mentioned something about two young kids and that she had mentioned these two kids didn't seem right. Um, One thing that, to point out that we noticed right away is the coloring of these two little girls. They were extremely pale in comparison to to Philip, they were extremely, extremely pale, bright blue eyes, just like him. I mean, just penetratingly blue eyes. Not and then the younger daughter said, and we have an older sister that lives with us too. She's 28. And the older sibling said, without missing a beat, 29. And went right back. So I go and I call the probation officer who's not there. I leave a message just describing my concerns about, you know, he came into our station. He brought all his literature. He seems like he's disturbed. I don't know if that's normal behavior for him. He brought his two daughters with him. They seemed a little out of touch with reality and very robotic. And my main concern was for them. If you could give me a call back, um, I would appreciate either a visit. Maybe he could check in with you or at least a home visit or something to check on these little girls. And that I thought was going to be the end of it. He calls me back and I talk to him the next day, which is now Wednesday morning. He says, can you please tell me the situation again? So I described the situation to him, and he stops me when I said, you know, he brought in his two daughters. He says he doesn't have any daughters. Greedo was arrested and his house searched for breach of parole by being around minors. Parole officers arranged an interview for the next day to clear up this situation. Greedo arrived at the interview the next day with wife Nancy's two daughters and JC pretending to be a woman called Alyssa. So they were all split up for interviews to get to the bottom of the situation. JC finally admitted who she was and what Garrido had done to her for 18 years. Garrido was sentenced to 451 years in prison and Nancy got 36 years. Still investigating the matter. But in fact, a federal investigation had already been completed months ago and was kept confidential. Fortunately, just this past Thursday, a U.S. district judge decided to release the report which concluded Garrido's federal probation office did not follow commonly accepted supervision practices and had failed to adequately supervise Philip Garrido. Most chilling is this. One may fairly question whether Garrido could have been deterred from the horrendous acts attributed to him had his federal supervision been conducted properly. JC was awarded a $20 million settlement to compensate her for the state's various lapses. She's also released two books helping survivors of sexual abuse. Had many interviews over the years talking about the events and her mindset now. That's about it. Stay safe, guys.